Welcome to Physics Next Book. In this video, we shall talk about the Lorentz factor gamma. In relativity, the Lorentz factor is omnipresent. In the expressions of length contraction, time dilation, relativistic definition of energy and momentum, relativistic mass. Well, relativistic mass is a bad apple, we shall talk about it in another video. But the point is, look anywhere in relativity, you will see the Lorentz factor hanging around. So, where does the Lorentz factor come from and why do we see it ever so often in relativity? In relativity textbooks, we come across the derivation of Lorentz factor in context of the photon bouncing clock. A nice thought experiment or Gedenken experiment where an observer inside a uniformly moving cart with speed v in the x direction let us say, sends a photon across the cart in the y direction. The photon reflects back to the sender from a mirror hung on the opposite wall while he stood still in the cart at the same spot. So he claims that the photon must have travelled only in the y direction and covered precisely twice the width of the cart and calculates the time interval between the emission and reception events as delta t which is 2l the distance covered by the photon divided by c the speed of the photon. He can keep bouncing the photon and think of it as a time keeping device every round trip by the photon counts for an interval delta t hence the name photon clock. Now, the observers on ground also witness the emission and reception events, but unlike the cart observer, they can see the cart move in the x direction in the meantime. So they naturally claim that the photon is moving up and down as well as sideways, covering a longer distance. In fact, assuming an unknown time interval delta t prime between the emission reception events, the ground observers can apply Pythagoras theorem to calculate the total distance covered by the photon. Then they can divide the distance covered by the photon speed c to set up an equation for computing the ground frame time interval delta t prime. The unusual thing is they also use the same speed c for the photon as the observer on board the cart did. Why? Because that's what the postulates of relativity says. The speed of photon is universally the same for all observers, the one on board the cart and those on the ground. So basically they agree on the speed. But the ground observers say that the photon covers a longer distance than what the cart observer claims. Naturally, delta t prime calculated from ground turns out to be longer than delta t calculated from the cart. How much longer? Well, a little algebra, you know, squaring the equation for delta t prime, rearranging the brackets, changing sides, you can easily factor the delta t prime out to one side. On the other side, we get 2L by C. That's the time interval calculated in the card frame, remember? So that times another factor which only depends on the relative velocity between the ground and the card. So this factor, basically the ratio of delta t prime over delta t is what we call the Lorentz factor or gamma factor. As the speed of the card is always a fraction of the speed of light, so 1 minus v by c squared is again a fraction, its square root is again a fraction and its inverse the Lorentz factor is always greater than 1. Its value keeps growing very rapidly as the relative velocity v by c, a fraction in units of light speed, approaches 1. So we have got the Lorentz factor. But we should ask ourselves, why do we see it so very often in relativity? Is the photon bouncing clock such a big deal? Not really. The photon clock just provides a straightforward demonstration that different frames calculate or measure different time intervals between a given pair of events, the emission and reception events of the photon in this case. That is, time ticks differently in different inertial frames. But this result is not limited to photon clocks only. It is a very very general result. Types of clock doesn't really matter. If the ground and the cart observers use high precision digital stopwatches and measure the time intervals instead of calculating them, their readings would differ by the same Lorentz factor. Can we go into the nitty gritties of these digital stopwatches to show how Lorentz factor appears in there? Probably not. But the point is, we don't need to, cause the Lorentz factor has nothing to do with how a given clock works. It comes from the fundamental nature of time in relativity. Let's see how. To demonstrate this, we need to know a fundamental feature of relativity, which is the invariance of space-time interval. There is a dedicated video on space-time interval and its invariance on this channel. Link is in the i button and description, you may want to try that. Anyway, in the photon clock experiment, the space-time interval of concern is in between the photon emission and reception events. According to the ground observer, after sending the photon, the cart observer moved with speed v 
for a time interval delta t prime covering a spatial distance v times delta t prime before receiving the photon pack. The space-time interval in the ground frame is thus c squared times the time interval squared minus square of the spatial distance covered. In the card frame, however, the observer sent and received the photon standing at the same spot. So he covered no spatial distance at all as far as he is concerned. He only saw the card clock ticking for a duration delta t between the events. So in the card frame, the space-time interval is just c squared times delta t squared. Now the invariance of space-time interval means its value is the same in the ground frame and the card frame. So we equate the two, factor out the c squared delta t squared from the right hand side, cancel the c squared from both sides and take the square root. Can you see the Lorentz factor? Yeah, we are back with the same ratio. Did we consider the photon's journey across the cart and calculate the value of delta t and delta t prime explicitly? No, because the values don't matter. Whatever they are, they will always have the same ratio, the Lorentz factor. In fact, the emission and reception of the photon had no great role to play either. They just happened to be the two reference events we considered. Honestly, some other pair of events, for example, two consecutive claps by the cart observer while he stood rooted to his spot within the moving cart, would have done the job. In our photon clock example, the moving cart, the photon, the clock inside the cart, even the observer on board, all are part of the system that is being observed and analyzed by the ground observers. The time interval shown by the cart clock is what we call proper time. It's the time read by the clock carried by the system. And the time interval measured in the ground clock is what we call coordinate time because the ground observer is usually the one who draws up the space-time coordinates, deals with the space-time diagram, analyzes, and so on. Think about it. In any given scenario in special relativity, there is always the observer's clock giving coordinate time and the system's own clock giving proper time. The system acts according to its own time, the proper time. But we observers want to track the system in terms of our coordinate time. So the conversion factor, the Lorentz factor, appears almost everywhere in relativity. If you have made it this far, hopefully you have liked the video, do let me know in the comment section. If you are a bit flustered by the idea of space-time interval and its invariance, check out the video on the right. Dedicated video on proper time versus coordinate time is on the left. Meet you there. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.